My name is Jane Eyre. I was born in 1820, a harsh time of change in England. Money and position seemed all that mattered. Charity was a cold and disagreeable word. Religion too often wore a mask of bigotry and cruelty. There was no proper place for the poor or the unfortunate. I had no father or mother, brother or sister. As a child, I lived with my aunt, Mrs. Reed of Gateshead Hall. I do not remember that she ever spoke one kind word to me. Careful, Missy. She bites. Come on out, Jenny. Mrs. Reed wants to see you in the drawing room. Knock. Don't bully the child. Knock. Come in. This, Mr. Brocklehurst, is the child in question. She's the daughter of my late husband's sister. By an unfortunate union which we in the family prefer to forget. For some years she's lived in this house. The recipient, I can clearly see, of every care which a loving benefactress could lavish upon her. Come here, little girl. What is your name? Jane Eyre, sir. Well, Jane Eyre, and are you a good child? The less said on that subject, the better. Indeed. Only this morning she struck her little cousin most brutally and without provocation. That isn't true. Jane. He hit me first. Yes. Silence. John, dear. Did you strike her first? No one did, Mama. You did. You know you did. And you knocked me down and hit my head and made it bleed. I did you not. Did, you Silence. did. You did. I won't listen to your odious lies. You see, Mr. Brocklehurst, how passionate and wicked she is. I do indeed. Come here, child. You and I must have some talk. No sight so sad as that of a wicked child. Do you know where the wicked go after death? They go to hell. And what is hell? A pit full of fire. And should you like to fall into that pit and be burning there forever? No, sir. Then what must you do to avoid it? I must keep in good health and not die. But children younger than you die daily. Only last week, we buried a little child of five. A good little child, whose soul is now in heaven. What of your soul, Jane Eyre? I don't see why it shouldn't go to heaven, too. You don't see, but others see clearly enough, do they not, Mrs. Reed? You have heard the name of Lowood? No, sir. It is a school for unfortunate orphans. My estate lies within a mile, and as chairman of the board, I spend much time in its supervision. Would you like to go there, little girl? You mean not live here anymore? I don't know what Aunt Reed would say. It was your kind benefactress who suggested the plan. Do you wish to go? Yes, sir. You've made a wise choice, wiser than you know. And now you must pray God to take away your heart of stone and make you meek and humble and penitent. And you may rest assured, Mrs. Reed, we shall do our best to collaborate with the Almighty. Sorry to leave your poor old Bessie. What does Bessie care for me? She's always scolding and punishing. All the same, I am rather sorry to be leaving you. Rather sorry? Is that all? And I suppose if I asked you to give me a kiss, you'd say you would rather not. I'll kiss you and welcome Bessie. You're such a strange, solitary little thing. Here's a keepsake, Jane. It'll help you remember me. Come on, hurry up. Be a good girl, and I hope you'll be happy. Thank you, Bessie. Goodbye. Bye, Jane. I'll never come and see you when I'm grown up, and I'll never call you aunt as long as I... 
I live. And if anyone asks me how you treated me, I'll say you are bad and hard-hearted and mean. And the very sight of you makes me sick. <laughs> Drawing lessons and French lessons and history lessons and music lessons. And there'll be hundreds of other girls to play with. <laughs> and uh, what's the name of the school of yours? It's called Lowood. 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 <laughs> Sleep for hours. By the way, Bill. I was to waken in the morning to find my dreams of Lowood shattered. In that place was to stand a school that was more like a prison, dominated by the cold, implacable cruelty of Mr. Brock Lannister. Pills. Observe this child. She is yet young. She possesses the ordinary form of girlhood. No single deformity points her out as a marked character. Who would believe that the evil one had already found in her a servant and an agent? Yet such I grieve to tell you is the case. Therefore, you must be on your guard against her. Shun her example. Avoid her company, exclude her from your sports, and shut her out from your converse. Teachers, you must watch her. Weigh well her words and scrutinize her actions. Punish her body to save her soul. For it is my duty to warn you, and my tongue falters as I tell it, that this girl, this child, the native of a Christian land, no better than many a little heathen that says its prayers to Brahma and kneels before Juggernaut. This girl is a liar. Let her remain on that stool. Let no one speak to her for the rest of the day. brought you this from supper. Didn't you hear what he said? He said you mustn't have anything to do with me. Go on, take it. I'm not bad. I promise I'm not. But I hate him. I hate him! It's wrong to hate people. I can't help it! I thought school would be a place where people would love me. 
I want people to love me and believe in me and be kind to me. I'd let my arm be broken if it would make anyone love me. Or let a horse kick me. Or be tossed by a bull. Don't say such things. But I would! I would! Eat your bread, Jane. Merciful Providence, who of thy generous plenty doth give us the abundant fruits of the field for our sustenance, grant us that though we are duly and properly grateful for this our earthly food, yet our hearts may be more lastingly fixed upon thy heavenly manner. Amen. Helen, where does that road go? I told you before, to Bradford. But after Bradford, Derby, I suppose, and Nottingham, and then London. London to Dover, and across the sea to France, and then over the mountains and down to Italy, and to Florence, and Rome, and Madrid. Madrid isn't in Italy, Jane. That road goes there all the same. And we'll drive along it one day, when we're grown up, Helen, in a lovely coach and four. And I'll have beautiful curly hair just like yours. And I'll have read all the books in the world. And I'll play the piano and talk French, almost as well as you do. Dreaming again, Jane? Oh, Dr. Rivers! I know somebody who's going to be late for inspection. Not this time. I'll beat you there. <laughs> doesn't seem any better, Helen. We'll have to take care of it. Thank you. You keep your schoolroom uncommonly cold, Mr. Brocklehurst. A matter of principle, Dr. Rivers. Our aim is not to pamper the body, but to strengthen the soul. I should hardly have thought that a bad cough was any aid to salvation. But then I'm not a theologian. Good day, sir. I may venture an opinion, When sir. I want your opinion, madam, I shall call for it. Johnson, you poke your chin most unpleasantly. Draw it in. Edwards, I insist on your holding your head up. I will not have you stand before me in that attitude. Miss Scatchard? Fetch me the scissors immediately. What, may I ask, is the meaning of this? Why, in defiance of every precept and principle of this establishment, is this young person permitted to wear her hair in one mass of curls? Her hair curls naturally, sir. Miss Scatchard, how often must I tell you we are not here to conform to nature? I want these girls to be children of grace. Please, please, sir, don't do that. You can cut mine, sir, as much as you wish, but please... Silence! So this is the spirit that prevails at Lowood. First vanity, and now insurrection. It shall be rooted out. <laughs> this oil for Helen. I want her chest rubbed with it. Helen, Doctor? Yes, I'm concerned about her lungs. I've spoken to Mr. Bro... Good heavens, madam. What are those children doing out in the rain? It was Mr. Brocklehurst's order. Well, bring them in at once. What shall I say to Mr. Brocklehurst? You can refer Mr. Brocklehurst to me. With your leave, Dr. Rivers, I shall offer up one more prayer. Almighty God, 
look down upon this miserable sinner and grant that the sense of her weakness may give strength to her faith and seriousness to her repentance. Amen. The ways of providence are inscrutable, Dr. Rivers. Was it providence that sent that poor girl to get drenched in the rain? Dr. Rivers! Was it providence that ordered her to her death? Yes, to her death, Mr. Brocklehurst. Jane. No, I want to stay here. I want to be with Helen. Helen isn't here. Helen's with God. Jane, remember what you say in your prayers every day. Thy will be done. Do you think you're doing God's will by giving way to despair? God wants children to be brave and strong. Won't you do what God wants? I'll try. That's right. Don't forget, the harder you try, the more God will help you. Now let me take you back. No, I can't go back to school. I'll never go back. I'll run away. Jane, you know what duty is, don't you? Duty is what you have to do, even when you don't want to do it. I may not want to go out into a snowstorm to visit a sick child, but I know I have to go because it's my duty. Now, what is your duty, Jane? I don't know. Yes, you do, Jane. In your heart, you know perfectly well. Your duty is to prepare yourself to do God's work in the world. Isn't that true? And who can do God's work? An ignorant woman or an educated one? Yes, you know the answer to that. And where can you get an education, Jane? Where? At school. Precisely. So you know you have to go back to school, even though you may hate the very thought of it. Isn't that true? Good, Jane. Very good. Gentlemen, we had some difficulties in the beginning. A very stiff-necked and evil child. Today has been with us ten years, and in those ten years it has been granted me to plant her feet in the path of salvation. I suppose we ought to see her. I intended that you should. Let her be brought in. I don't need to remind you of the advantages of appointing one of our own pupils as teacher. An outsider will have to be paid twice as much. Heir, this is a solemn moment. Little did I imagine that the unregenerate child I received into this institution would grow in ten short years to become a teacher. Yes, a teacher. For that is the honor which the trustees at my recommendation have now bestowed upon you. 
Your wages will be 20 guineas per annum, from which only 10 will be withheld for board and lodging, for spiritual instruction and laundry. Your duties will begin on the first day of the new term. I need detain you no longer, gentlemen. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. Here is the post, sir. That is all, yeah. I cannot accept your offer, sir. And why not, pray? I do not wish to stay at Lowood. This is unheard of. The ingratitude. What have I to be grateful for? Ten years of harshness and strength. Silence! Stiff-necked as ever, I see that I've been sadly deceived in you. And where, may I ask, do you intend to go? Out into the world, sir. Out into the world. And you know how the world treats young paupers without friends or connections? I intend to find a position as a governess. How, may I ask? I've advertised in a newspaper. Oh. And doubtless you've been overwhelmed with demands for your services. No, sir. And you never will be. You have no talents. Your disposition is dark and rebellious. Your appearance insignificant. It's folly to dream of such a position. Air, you heard me. I'm willing to overlook your ungracious outburst, but I warn you, if you persist in your folly, this haven will never again be open to you. I am leaving Lowood, sir. Jane, it's not every young woman that can face the world single-handed. But you know what right is. You'll stick to it through thick and thin. No, 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 no. The guineas are New York, lad. Excuse me. Could you tell me if there's anyone here from Mrs. Fairfax of Thornfield Hall? Not that I've heard, ma'am. Take seat in coffee room and I'll inquire. Who's the young lady, Sam? Couldn't say, sir. Just coming by coach. Well, give her my compliments and ask if she'd care to join me in a glass of Madeira. Yes, sir. The gentleman over there presents his compliments. Asks if you'd care to take a glass of summit with him. Oh, no, thank you. I, I never take wine. Your name here? Yes, I'm Miss Eyre. Are you from Thornfield? You're not the new governess. Yes, I am. <laughs> Is this all your luggage? Yes. Fairfax, you're here. Thank you. Hi, 
how do you do, my dear? I'm afraid you've had a tedious journey. I'm Mrs. Fairfax. Why, your hand is like ice. Come, I'll take you straight to your room. We have a nice, cozy fire burning there for you. And Leah's taken the chill off the sheet with the warming pan. You know, dear, I'm so glad you've come. Living here with no company but the servants, it's not too cheerful, I can tell you. I do declare not a living creature but the butcher and the postman has come to this house since the hard weather set in. Shall I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax tonight? Miss Fairfax? Oh, you mean Miss Adele. Isn't she your daughter? Oh, gracious, no. Adele is French. I have no family. No family at all. That's Mr. Edward's room. He's abroad, of course, but I always keep it ready for him. His visits are always so unexpected and sudden. A wanderer on the face of the earth. That's what Mr. Edward is, I'm afraid. Mr. Edward? Who is Mr. Edward? Why, the owner of Thornfield, of course. Oh, I thought this was your house. Mine. Bless your soul, child. I'm only the housekeeper. Thornfield belongs to Mr. Edward Rochester, and little Adele is his ward. And here is your room, my dear. It's quite small, but I thought you'd like it better than one of the large front chambers. Oh, it's very beautiful. I can't understand why a gentleman of the house like this so seldom comes to it. It is strange. But you'll find, Miss Eyre, that in many ways, Mr. Edward is a strange man. Good night, my dear. Good night. Bonjour, mademoiselle. Mama had a dress like that, mademoiselle. Only she could dance much more beautifully. I can dance, too. Do you wish to see? Now, this very moment. Now you speak like Monsieur Rochester. For him, it is never the right moment. Mais jamais. Your name's Adele, isn't it? Do you know what I was thinking, Adele? I was just thinking that never in my life have I been awakened so happily. A great when the gentlemen and ladies came to see Mama, and I used to dance before them, or sit on their knees and sing to them. I liked it. And where was that? In Paris. We live always in Paris. But then when Mama had gone to the Holy Virgin, Monsieur Rochester came and took me across the sea in a great sheep with a chimney that smoked, and I was sick. Five, six, and three. Do you like Monsieur Rochester? I've not met him yet. This is his chair. He sits here and stares into the fire and frowns like this. <laughs> is he as bad as that? Twice as bad. I cannot make how bad he is. But I'm sure he's very kind to me. Oh, sometimes he brings me beautiful presents. But when he's angry, that's terrible. And may the Holy Virgin give me grace. And God bless Monsieur Rochester. And make him polite to Mademoiselle, so she will stay with me forever and ever. Amen.
stand out of the way. I'm sorry I frightened you, boss. Apologies won't mend my ankle. Down, Violet! Well, what are you waiting for? I can't leave until I see you're fit to ride. Hmm, a will of your own. Where are you from? From Mr. Rochester's house just below. You know Mr. Rochester? No, I've never seen him. You're not a servant at the hall. I'm the new governess. Oh. I'm the new governess. Just hand me my whip. Thank you. Now kindly get out of the way. <laughs> with your things. He's been asking to see the new governess. Who? Why, Mr. Rochester, of course. Rode in on us suddenly without any warning. And in such a vile humor. Seems he had an accident. I don't know what to do. He won't let me send for the doctor. Oh, my goodness, your bonnet. Here is Miss Ayer, sir. Well, Miss Eyre, have you no tongue? I was waiting, sir, until I was spoken. Very to. proper. Next time you see a man on a horse, don't run out in the middle of the road till he's passed. I assure you, sir, it was not deliberate. It may not have been deliberate. It was nonetheless painful. Sit down, Miss Eyre. Where did he come from? From Lowood Institution, sir. Lowood? What's that? It's a charity school. I was there ten years. Ten years? You must be tenacious of life. No wonder you have rather the look of another world. I marveled where you got that sort of face. When you came on me in the mist, I found myself thinking of fairy tales. I had half a mind to demand whether you'd bewitched my horse. Indeed, I'm not sure yet. Who are your parents? I have none, sir. Your home? I have no home, sir. Who recommended you to come here? I advertised him. Mrs. Fairfax hunted the advertisement. Uh, you came post haste to be here in time to throw me off my horse. Hmm. What did you learn at Lowood? Did you play the piano? A little. Of course. It's the established answer. Going to the drawing room. I mean, if you please. Excuse my tone of command. I'm used to saying do this and it is done. I cannot alter my customary habits for one new inmate. Take a candle with you, leave the door open. Sit down at the piano and play a tune. rather better than some. Not well. Good night, Miss Ayer. Good night. What sort of man was this master of Thornfield, so proud, sardonic, and harsh? 
Instinctively, I felt that his malignant mood had its source in some cruel cross of fate. I was to learn that this was indeed true, and that beneath the harsh mask he assumed, lay a tortured soul, fine, gentle, and kindly. Noise, Grace. I've spoken to you before. Did I mistake, my dear? I'm so sorry. I had to say something to Grace Poole. She's a person we have to do the sewing. Not altogether unobjectionable, but she does her work. How did you get on with Mr. Rochester, my dear? Is he always so changeful and abrupt? Well, he has his little peculiarities of temper, of course. But then allowances should be made. Why for him more than for anyone else? Partly because that's his nature, and partly, too, because he has painful thoughts. What about? Family troubles. I think that's why he so seldom comes to Thornfield. It has unpleasant associations for him. Good night, my dear. Good night, Mrs. Fairfax. I'm not fond of the prattle of children. As you see, I'm a crusty old bachelor, and I have no pleasant associations connected with their lisp. In this house, the only alternative is the prattle of a simple-minded old lady, which is nearly as bad. Today, I feel disposed to be gregarious and communicative, and I believe you could amuse me. You puzzled me a great deal that first evening in the library, monsieur. I've almost forgotten you since, but now I'm resolved to be at ease. It's only what pleases me. It would please me now to draw you out to learn more of you. Sit down, Miss Ed. No, draw it further back. Down just here, right? Placed it. Uh, forward a little. Still too far back. I can't see you without disturbing my position in this comfortable chair, which I have no mind to do. You examine me, Miss Eyre. Do you find me handsome? No, sir. Indeed. I beg your pardon. I was too plain. My answer was a mistake. Just so, and you should be answerable for it. Now then, explain. Does my forehead not please you? What do you tell from my head? Am I a fool? No, sir. Far from it. Would you say it is the head of a kindly man? Hardly that, sir. Very well, madam. I am not a kindly man. Though I did once have a sort of tenderness of heart, you doubt that? Yes. Since then, fortune's knocked me about, kneaded me with her knuckles, till now I flatter myself I'm as hard and tough as an india rubber ball, with perhaps one small sensitive point in the middle of the lump. Does that leave hope for me? Hope of what, sir? My retransformation from india rubber back to flesh. You look very puzzled, young lady. And a uh, puzzled air becomes you. Besides, it keeps those searching eyes of yours away from my face. You are silent, Miss Eyre. Stubborn. 
No, annoyed and... Quite rightly, so I put my request in an absurd way. And the fact is, once and for all, I do not wish to treat you as an inferior. But I battled through a varied experience with many men of many nations and roamed over half the globe while you've spent your whole life with one set of people in one house. Don't you agree that gives me a right to be a little masterful and abrupt? Do as you please, sir. You pay me 30 pounds a year for receiving your orders. 30 pounds? I've quite forgotten that. Well, on that mercenary ground, won't you agree to let me hector you a little? No, sir. Not on that ground, but on the ground that you did forget it and inquired of my feelings as an equal. Good. Well, then, you'll let me dispense with the conventional forms without thinking me insolent. I should never mistake informality for insolence. One I rather like. The other, no freeborn person would submit to even for a salary. Humbug. Most freeborn people who submit to anything for a salary. Where are you going? It's time for Adele's lesson. <laughs> oh, young lady. It's not for Adele that you're going. It's because you're afraid of me. You wish to escape me. In my presence, you're hesitant to smile gaily or speak too freely. Admit that you're afraid. I'm bewildered, sir, but I'm certainly not afraid. Don't I look beautiful, monsieur? This is how Mama used to do it, is it not? Precisely. That's how she charmed my English gold out of my breeches pocket. Then I shall dance for you. You will not. You go straight upstairs to the nursery. Oh, monsieur. At once. Monsieur. I'm not finished talking to you. Why are you looking at me like that? I was thinking, whatever your past misfortune, you have no right to revenge yourself on the child. You're quite right, of course. I was thinking only of myself, my own private memories and feelings. The fact is, nature meant me to be on the whole a good man. One of the better kind, but circumstance decreed otherwise. <laughs> I was as green as you once. I grass green. Now my spring is gone, leaving me what? This little artificial French flower. You may go, monsieur. Monsieur. I hope you'll be happy at Thornfield. I hope so, sir. I think so. I'm glad. Kill you. I heard footsteps along the gallery. Shall I call Mrs. Fairfax? Mrs. Fairfax? What the deuce do you want to call her for? Let her sleep. Come in, sit down. I'm going to leave you here. He's still as a mouse.
came out of your room. Did you see anything? Only a candlestick on the floor, but I... I heard a door shut. Anything else? Yes, a kind of laugh. Kind of laugh. Have you heard it before? There's a strange woman here called Grace Poole. But I... Just so. Grace Poole. You've guessed it. Well, let's see what's to be done. Meanwhile, say nothing about this to anyone. Adele, we forgot the child. I had an awful fear. You see what she has? Poor little Adele. Trying to console herself for my unkindness to her. Child has dancing in her blood and coquetry in the very marrow of her bones. <laughs> I once had the misfortune to be in love with this, to be jealous of that. Love's a strange thing, Miss Hare. You can know that a person's worthless without heart or mind to scruple, yet suffer to the point of torture when she betrays you. At least I had the pleasure of putting a pistol bullet through my rival's lungs. And the little doll in the dancing skirt? We tell Adele she died. The truth isn't quite so touching. I gave her some money and turned her out, whereupon she decamped with an Italian painter, leaving me with what she said was my daughter. Let me light you to your room. Well, monsieur, now that you know what your pupil is, the offspring of a French dancing girl. I suppose you'll be coming to tell me to look out for a new governess. Adele has had so little love, I shall try to make up for it. Are you always drawn to the loveless and unfriended? When it's deserved. Would you say that my life deserved saving? I should be distressed if harm came to so. But you did save my life tonight. I'd like to thank you for it. Please shake hands. I knew you'd do me good in some way, sometime. Good night, Jane. Good night, sir. Isn't it terrible? We might all have been burnt in our beds. Where did Mr. Rochester go? Well, he said something about a house party at Milcote. Goodness knows how long he'll be away. One can never tell with Mr. Rochester. Maybe a day or a year or a month. Mrs. Fairfax? Yes, my dear? Did Mr. Rochester tell you how the fire started? Why, of course. He was reading in bed and fell asleep with the candle lit. And the curtains took fire. Why do you ask? I wondered if the fire had anything to do with Mr. Rochester's leaving. Well, what possible connection could there be? He said this morning that he was restless. The house with only us here was unbearably oppressive for him. allowed up here. Understand? No one. Get thee down. 
Had the mystery in the tower driven him madly away, just as we seem so close together? Winter turned to spring and no news came. But I found a measure of escape in the happiness of Adele. Stop. Stand by the front door and be ready to take the gentleman's cloaks. Yes, madam. My dear, I'm so glad you're back. Mr. Rochester is so difficult. Leah, Leah, you must be with me to take the ladies to their room. Yes, ma'am. Imagine not even telling me how many guests he's bringing. Just said, get all the best bedrooms ready and more servants from the inn. They're coming, ma'am. Fifteen at least, far more than I prepared for. Who's that riding with Mr. Rochester? Why, that's Blanche Ingram, my dear. Haven't you heard about Miss Ingram and Mr. Rochester? She's quite an old flame of his. It wouldn't surprise me if it came to an engagement one of these days. Such a beautiful girl, isn't she? Where's Miss Ingram's ball? Coming as quickly as we can. Adele, why aren't you in the nursery? When must they let me know? No, dear, you're in the way. Didn't I tell you that Blanche had set her cap at him? Well, he is very romantic and enormously rich. Yeah. Oh, Miss Ayer, Mr. Rochester wishes you to bring Adele to the drawing room after dinner. Oh, please send Adele by herself. He only asked me out of politeness. Well, that's what I thought, and I told him you weren't used to company. Nonsense, he said. If she objects, I'll come and fetch her myself. Of course, you must wear your very best, my dear. I, I think the black. So I didn't have both birds, bang, bang. Then I got two more birds with my spare gun. <laughs> well, perhaps we'd better leave the gentleman to their port. They're coming, mademoiselle. Bonsoir, Madame. Bonsoir. What's your name? Adele. Now, Blanche, stop teasing, Mr. Rochester. Come along, my angel.
Gothic como un angelo mientras ahora. I think we've had enough music. Edward, I thought you weren't fond no, of children. No, nor am I. Run along, dear. Who used you to take charge of such a little puppet? Where did you pick her up? I did not pick her up. She was left on my hands. Well, I suppose you have a governess for her. I saw Kristen with her just now. Is she gone? Oh, no, there she is, still hiding in the corner. You should hear Mama on the subject of governesses. Governesses? Don't speak to me of governesses. The martyrdom I've endured with those creatures. The clever ones are detestable, and the others are grotesque. down there. Well, the devil's Edward, I'd like to know. Here he is. Edward, you haven't been hurt, have you? Put that pistol away, Colonel. Artillery is no good for nightmares. Nightmares? That's all it was. One of the maids had a bad dream, woke up screaming. Oh. Moral of that is, don't eat toasted cheese for supper. <laughs> now, ladies, you all go to your rooms. Lady Ingram, you set a good example. I declare I'm quite disappointed. I was so looking forward to seeing Uncle Percy shoot a robber. Now, Blanche, let's have your levity. Good night, Edmund. Sweet dreams, my courageous Blanche.
this way and make no noise. You don't turn sick at the sight of blood, do you? Never been tried. Let's give me a hand. Won't do to risk a fainting fit. Warm and steady. you see may shock and frighten and confuse you. I beg you not to seek an explanation. Don't try to understand. Whatever the appearance, you must trust me. room, this gentleman, when I fetch a surgeon, he will sponge the blood as I do now. If he comes to, do not speak to him on any account. Do you understand me? Whatever happens, do not move from here. Whatever happens, do not open a door, either door. Be on the alert. Give you half an hour for dressing the wound, getting the patient downstairs and all. Edward, uh, I'm done for, I fear. Nonsense. Lost a little blood, that's all. Sank her teeth into me like a tiger. Uh, she said she'd drain my heart's blood. Be silent, Mason. Forget it. She... Jane. Yes, sir. Go and get some things on. Go down the back stairs and bolt the side passage door. Find a carriage waiting. See if the driver's ready. Be down in a moment. Mason! I told you not to come up here! I thought I could have done some good. You thought, you thought! Come, Doctor, hurry. We must have him off. We've tried so long to avoid exposure. I shall make very certain it doesn't come now. Take care of him, Doctor. Or let him leave your house until he's quite well. Edward. Well, what is it? Let her be taken care of. Let her be treated as tenderly as may be. I do my best and have done it and will do it. night, Jane. A little pale. Mr. Rochester, will Grace Poole live here still? Yes. Grace Poole will stay. After last night... Don't ask for explanations. Just believe me when I tell you that there are reasons for it. Good reasons. You're my little friend, Jane, aren't you? I'd like to serve you, sir, in everything that's right. If I asked you to do something you thought was wrong, what then? My little friend would turn to me very quiet and pale and say, Oh, no, sir, it's impossible. Am I right? Jane, I want you to use your fancy. 
Suppose yourself a boy, a thoughtless, impetuous boy, indulged from childhood upwards. Imagine yourself in some remote foreign land. Conceive that you there commit a capital error. One that cuts you off from the possibility of all human joys. In your despair, you wander about vainly seeking contentment in empty pleasure. Then, suddenly, fate offers you the chance of regeneration. And true happiness. Are you justified in overleaping the obstacles of mere custom? Tell me, Jane. Are you justified? How can I answer, sir? Every conscience must come to its own decision. Or if it can't come to a decision, if you're afraid that you may bring shame to what you most cherish or destroy what you most desire to protect. Oh, Jane, don't you curse me for plaguing you like this. Curse you, no, sir. Give me your assurance on that. Cold fingers. They were warmer last night. Jane, will you watch with me again? For instance, the night before I married, will you sit with me then? Are you going to be married, sir? Sometime. Why not? What makes you think he's in the stable? Well, I suppose he's you think no one will have me. Well, you're wrong. You don't know these young ladies of fashion. They may not admire my person, but I assure you they dote on my purse. Blanche? Good morning, Edward. By right, I should scold you for running off like this. Mm -hmm. A correct host entertains his guests. My dear Blanche, when you learn, I never was correct nor ever shall be. Very pretty, partner. Splendid. Thank mm. you. Edward, I'm so glad you've made up your mind to come to London with us tomorrow. Have I? I didn't know. Of course you're very appropriate. What now, Edward? Put the red ball in the top pocket. Edward, does that person want you? I'm sorry, sir. I did not know you were occupied. Very good, monsieur. Sure, the ladies will excuse me. Governesses, Mama. I'm sorry, sir, but I understood you were leaving early in the morning, and I wish to ask you for a reference. Reference? What the deuce do you want a reference for? To get a new place, sir. Hmm? I, you, as good as told me that you were going to be married. Yes, what then? In which case, Adele ought to go to school. To get her out of my bride's way, who otherwise might walk over her rather too emphatically. Well, some sense in your suggestion, Jane. Adele, as you say, must go to school. And you must go to the devil, is that it? I hope not, sir, unless it's the devil who answers my advertisement. Advertisement? You mean say you've been advertising? Not yet, sir, but I shall. You'll do nothing of the kind. The time comes you'll get a new situation. I'll get one for you. Do you hear? Sir. Goodbye, Mr. Rochester. Goodbye, Miss Eyre. Jane, that all seems stingy to my notion. Dry and unfriendly. Won't you do more than just say goodbye? Well, I'll... I'll shake hands, sir. Well, you shake hands. It serves its purpose. Dungeon? Why, it's a paradise. Huh. Though, of course, if one lived here, one would really have to have a house in London, wouldn't one? Unquestionably, a little apartment in Paris, perhaps a villa in the Mediterranean. How delightful that would be. But Thornfield would always be there as a retreat from the world, a green haven of peace and... and love. Love? Who's talking of love? All a fellow needs is a bit of distraction, a 
house full of beautiful women every now and then to keep him brooding on his woes, uh, peering too closely into the mysteries of his heart. That is if he has a heart. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder, Edward, if you really do have one. Have I ever done or said anything to make you believe that I have? If so, I assure you it was quite unintentional. Are you never serious? Never more than at this moment, except perhaps when I'm eating my dinner. Really, Edward, you can be revoltingly coarse at times. Can I ever be anything else? Can you? Would I have come to Thornfield if you couldn't? Oh, that's a very nice point, Raj. Would you or would you not? Let's begin by considering the significant facts of the case first. Mr. Rochester's revoltingly coarse and as ugly as sin. Edward, Allow I'm me, not... my dear Blanche, I repeat, as ugly as sin. Secondly, he flirts sometimes, but is careful never to talk about love or marriage. However, this is the third point. Lady Ingram is somewhat impoverished, whereas the revolting Mr. Rochester has an assured income of 8,000 a year. And in view of all this, what is the attitude that Miss Blanche may be expected to take from my experience of the world? I'd surmise that she'd ignore or the coarseness, etc. Till such times, Mr. R. is safely hooked. No, no, no horseplay. I've never been so grossly insulted in insulted? all my life. Insulted? I merely paid you the enormous compliment of being completely honest. Mr. Rochester, you are a bore and a cur. Gone. I changed my mind. Or rather, the Ingram family changed theirs. Why are you crying? I was thinking about having to leave Thornfield. You've become quite attached to that foolish little Airedale, haven't you? To that simple old Fairfax. Yes. You'd be sorry to part with him. Yes, sir. It's always the way in this life. No sooner have you got settled in a pleasant resting place, you're summoned to move on. As I told you, sir, I shall be ready when the order comes. To come now. Then it, it's settled. All settled, even about your future situation. You found a place for me? Yes, Jane, I have, in the west of Ireland. You like Ireland, I think, with such warm-hearted people there. It's a long way off, sir. From what, Jane? from England and from Thornfield. Well. And from you, sir? Yes, Jane, it's a long way. When you get there, I shall probably never see you again. We've been good friends, Jane, haven't we? Yes, sir. Even good friends may be forced to part. Let's make the most of what time has left us. Let us sit here in peace. Even though we should be destined never to sit here again. Sometimes I have a queer feeling with regard to you, Jane. Especially when you're near me as now. It's as if I had a string somewhere under my left rib. Tightly and inextricably knotted to a similar string situated in a corresponding corner of your little frame. And if we should have to be parted, that cord of communion would be snapped. I have a nervous notion I should take to bleeding inwardly. As for you, you'd forget me. That I never will, sir. You know that. See the necessity of going, but it's like looking on the necessity of death. Where do you see that necessity? In your bride. What bride? I have no bride. But you will have. Yes, I will. I will. Do you think I could stay here to become nothing to you? Do you think because I'm poor and obscure and plain that I'm soulless and heartless? I have as much soul as you, and fully as much heart. And if God had gifted me with wealth and beauty, I should have made it as hard for you to leave me as... as it is now for me to leave you. Here I've spoken my heart, and let me go. Jane. Jane. Strange. This almost unearthly thing. 
that I love is my own flesh. Don't walk. Don't walk. I don't for Blanche. It's you I want. Answer me, Jane, quickly. Say it, would I'll marry you. Say it, Jane. Say it. Not read your face. Read quickly. Say it, would I'll marry you. doubts and all the grim shadows that hung over Thornfield seemed to vanish, shattered like the riven chestnut tree. I loved and I was loved. Every sunlit hour I looked forward to love's fulfillment. Jane, what do you think you're doing? Teaching Adele as usual. As usual as a new heaven and a new earth, you go on teaching Adele as usual. What is wrong with that? Because I'm going to marry Mademoiselle and take Mademoiselle to the moon and find a cave in one of the white valleys and Mademoiselle will live with us there forever. Do you approve? Monsieur, there is no one I'd rather you marry, not even Mrs. Fairfax. And some of that and the uh, length of the scarlet. Yes, and I tell you, I never And the length of the scarlet and some of the gold silk. Yeah, my lady, off again yeah, each way and Lord Madden's finished. There's 35 in a tenner. Oh, bless you, Lord. Go away, Mother. The pretty lady's pretty going to marry me and we shall make our future ourselves. I require and charge ye both, as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why you may not lawfully be joined in matrimony, Ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that if any persons are joined together otherwise than as the word of God doth allow, then are they not joined by God, nor is their matrimony lawful. Edward Rochester, wilt thou have this woman to be thy wedded wife? One moment, please. I declare the existence of an impediment. Proceed to the ceremony. You cannot proceed. Mr. Rochester has a wife, now living. Who are you? My name is Briggs. I am an attorney. Mr. Mason, on the 20th of October, 1824, Edward Rochester of Thornfield Hall was married to Bertha Mason at St. Mary's Church, Spanish Town, Jamaica. The record of the marriage will be found in the register of that church. It's true, it's true, I swear it. She's now living at Thornfield. I've seen her there myself. I'm her brother. Parson, close your book. There'll be no wedding today. Instead, I invite you all to my house to meet Grace Poole's patient. My wife. To the right about, every one of you. Away with your congratulations. Fifteen years too late. forever without hope of divorce. This is what I wish to have. This young girl who stands so grave and quiet at the mouth of hell. Look at the difference. And then judge me.
Jane. Jane. I did not even know her. I was married at 19 in Spanish town to a bride already courted for me. But I married her. Gross, groveling, mole-eyed blockhead that I was. Jane, hear me. I suffered all the agonies of a man bound to a wife at once, intemperate, unchaste. I watched her excesses drive her at last into madness. And I brought her back to England, to Thornfield. Jane added everything that God and humanity demanded. And I fled from this place. My fixed desire was to find a woman I could love. A contrast to the fury I left here. What did I find? A French dancing girl, a Viennese milliner, a Neapolitan countess with a taste for jewelry. Back to England. I rode again in sight of Thornfield. Someone was walking there in the moonlight. A strange little elfin-like creature. It frightened my horse and then came up and gravely offered me help. I was to be aided and by that hand. And aided I was. And then later that evening, do you remember, Jane? Say you remember. I remember. You came into that room. How shy you were. And yet how readily and roundly you answered my questions. And then you smiled at me. That moment I knew it found you. Jane, can you not forgive me? I do forgive you. And you still love me. I do love you with all my heart. I can say it now since it's for the last time. You mean to go one way in the world? Let me go another. Stay with me, Jane. We would be hurting nobody. We should be hurting ourselves. Would it be so wicked to love me? Would it? I could crush you between my hands. But your spirit would still be free. Jane. You are going. I am going, sir. You will not be my comforter, my rescuer, my deep love, my frantic prayer. They're nothing to you. God bless you, my dear master. God keep you from harm and wrong. Jane. 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 Going nowhere, I had nowhere to go. Without references, I could not find employment. I knew hunger and unsheltered nights. At last, old memories, rather than my will, drew me back to Gateshead Hall, to Bessie, who had once been kind to me. Bessie, if you're looking for work, we haven't got no work for no one nowadays. You look poorly, lass. If you're cold, you're welcome to sit by the fire. Sit down, lass. You gave it to me, Bessie. Jane! Jane Eyre! A grown young lady and you were such a tiny thing, no higher than a broomstick. Oh, Miss Jane. That's your poor aunt. Oh, don't tell Audrey I'm here, or Cousin John, or anyone. Master John isn't here anymore. As soon as he was of age, he was off to London. Gambling, that's what it was. Thousands and thousands of pounds the missus paid for him. She had to shut up most of the house and turn off the other servants. But still he kept plaguing her for money. Then, last summer, he killed himself, Miss Jane. They found him hanging in his room and the cards still on the table where they'd played the night before. And they told the missus she had a kind of stroke. 
wandering like in her mind. Is that you, Bessie? Yes, ma'am. Who are you? Go away. I'm Jane Aldred. Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. Yeah. Nobody could know the trouble I've had with that child. A little pauper, right? Should have been in the workhouse. Jane, Jane, oh, oh, don't leave me, Jane, please don't leave me. I won't leave you. Also, oh, Mrs. Can't see nobody. She's been ill for months. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to make some inquiries about a niece of hers, Miss Eyre. Oh, would you would you wait inside a moment, sir? Thank you. Thank you. A gentleman to see you, Miss Jane. Oh, I don't want to see him. I don't want to see anyone. No, don't be foolish. You can't live all alone like the man on the moon. I'll sit with the missus. Run along now. He's waiting. Jane! How did you know I was here? I didn't. I was trying to find you. I received an inquiry about you the other day. You didn't stay in that place you went to very long, did you? Didn't you like it? What happened? I had to leave. Forgive me, it's no business of mine. All the same, I do feel obliged to ask you about this letter. It comes from a lawyer in Milkett. He writes to me as the person whose name you gave as reference when you went to Thornfield. That's near Milkett, isn't it? A client of his wants to know your whereabouts. You know who's inquiring for you? Jane, if you don't want me to talk about this anymore, I won't. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. It's for you to say. Or would you rather I didn't answer it at all? Thirty shillings, thirty-five bob. Any advance of thirty-five? Two pounds is bid. Going to two pounds. Going, going. Take it away, Bill. soul in pain, an appeal so wild and urgent that I knew I must go and go quickly. Only when I knew what had happened to him, only when I'd looked once more upon that tortured face, could I make my decision. It was she who did it, Miss Ayer. She struck down Grace Poole as she slept, and then she set fire to Thornfield. 
It was her laugh in the gallery that woke me. I ran into the nursery and wrapped Adele in a shawl and carried her down. And as we came out into the courtyard, I heard her laugh again. I looked up, and there she was on the roof, laughing and waving her arms above the battlements. Mr. Edwards saw her as he came out. He did not say anything, but went straight back into the house to try to save her. All this side of the house was blazing. There was smoke everywhere. And then it cleared. And suddenly we saw Mr. Edward behind her on the battlements. She saw him too. He came towards her to help her down. She stood very still for a moment. And just as he seemed to reach her, he gave a dreadful scream and ran from him to the edge. The next moment, she lay smashed on the pavement before us. She was dead, Miss Eyre. Mr. Edward. The great staircase fell in as he was coming down. Supper. Yes. Here, pilot. Sir. Who are you? I've come back, sir. Edward. My little fingers. Hmm. My small, soft fingers. Here. A little flower, soft face. And a heart, too, Edward. Jane. All you can feel now is mere pity. I don't want your pity. You can't spend your life on the mere wreckage of a man. You're young and fresh. You want to get married. Don't send me away. Please don't send me away. You think I want to let you go? Once went past, he came to see the light once more, as well as to feel its warmth. To see first the glory of the sun, and then the mild splendor of the moon, and at last the evening star. And then one day, when our firstborn was put into his arms, he could see that the boy had inherited his own eyes as they once were, large, brilliant, and black. Mm -hmm. 